So good evening, everyone. I see we lost a few people. Sorry, I hope that they're over in the trade show and just enjoying their coffee break. Um, uh, so uh, a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, after this, we will be having a night reception over in the trade show, so I would highly encourage you to stick around. We're going to have some um, really fun times in the, uh, with the graphic drawer. Um, and then from there, there's actually those people that are staying at Baymont or in the area, that area, Black Swan is going to have a really cool Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition party. So if you're interested in checking out some local brews and enjoying some more company of these great people that you probably won't see again for the next year, um, definitely check out the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition. Um, and if you're not a member, they are in the trade show. Uh, the other thing that I want to remind everyone is, is that if you're not coming back tomorrow, amazingly enough, this year you guys didn't get evaluation sheets that you had to fill out. Isn't that great? Yay! Yeah. What you're going to get is an online, super easy Qualtrics. And the I idea for us is that we need to get input for you from you guys to make this even better every single year. So I'm going to give you some examples. First of all, this is the first year that every single session is being recorded. Every single year we've done the Small Farm Conference, you guys have said, you know what I hate about the conference? There's so many great things to go and see. I can't do them all. And so guess what? By paying your registration, you guys will have access to every single one of the things that is on, this, on the, session, uh, the sessions. <laughs> so yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you get all of them, even if you only came today. The idea is, is this year we're going to get you get all of them. We're going to see how it goes. Um, anyone that did not pay will not get to see get an access code. So you guys can probably give those access codes out. I'm hoping you don't because what we're trying to do is entice people to actually come and pay the registration fee and be here. Um, and yeah, I mean, yes, there is that whole common property that somebody could grab the access code and get it for free and not having paid the registration fee. But the hope is that by doing this, this will keep you guys to coming back um, every single year. Uh, the other thing is, is y you may not realize this, but what you guys write in your evaluations literally guides our discussions as to what we decide to put on, this, on the program. So this is not, oh, somebody at Purdue is doing research on this. We're going to have them come and deliver it to you. No, literally, Ariana Torres came and talked about pricing because you guys asked for that. So it's really important to get your feedback. And as much as you hate filling out evaluation forms, those evaluations really, really help to guide the success of this, prod this, this conference in the future. So you're going to get an, a link. Hopefully you'll do that link and you will send us back your, your, um, your input so that we can continue improving this year after year. Um, Julie, did I get everything on that? Okay. <laughs> uh, the last thing I want to just say for housekeeping before I introduce our speaker who is who you really want to listen to is we start again tomorrow at 8.45 in the morning. Um, we, we will start on time because we have a full day planned and we want to make sure we get everything in. And if you have any questions, concerns, Make sure you look for somebody like that has a shirt on like me. They should be able to answer whatever questions you have. So without further ado, we're going to be here um, listening to uh, uh, the keynote speaker who has been here since yesterday. He did a, a full day workshop for those that weren't able to attend and then two sessions today. Michael Phillips, as you all know, is a farmer and all kinds of other things like a writer, organic consultant. He has books that are in the trade show if you haven't picked up some of his books. Um, he has been, I, I think, one of the premier people that have talked about how soil is so important and the microbiology that's living in the soil. And today we're going to be um, hearing a little bit more about his story of uh, soil redemption songs. So thank you, Michael, for coming and staying, spending so much time with us. We appreciate all that you have to say, and we look forward to your talk. talk. Wow, and suddenly, let's get this right, and suddenly I'm up here. Um, I've been really pleased to come to Indiana, and I've been enjoying the conversations and the questions I've been having with some of you, but no, wait, this, this is kind of like an inauguration thing. Let me see if I can pull this off. This is being filmed, and, and so this is like maybe going to be seen more by people, and there's too many empty chairs here, so the, the, if, we, if we could fill this swath, 
Just so it looks like this is the best attended keynote you've ever had in, in Indiana history. Um, yes, as Tamar said, we're going to look at what's going on with the soil life and what really is necessary to redeem our planet. Um, many of you are working in a regenerative direction and you're aware of the soil food web and still there's many who aren't really tuned into that and, and even when we start to tune into it we don't necessarily know the whole picture. So I've been talking about mycorrhizal fungi and, and, and their importance and main, making a healthy resilient ecosystem and, and there's all sorts of virtues that happen as a result of the union of plant roots with mycorrhizal fungi. And just to really emphasize that point, that word, mycorrhiza, the Greek roots, myco is the fungal kingdom, rhiza is the root realm, and it, it's the union of the two where the magic happens. Mycorrhizal fungi do not exist outside of plant roots. It has to be the union of plants with the fungi where photosynthesis results in carbon sugars that plants trade to the fungi, and fungi in turn bring many benefits back to the plants. And, and there's a lot we can learn from this symbiosis collaboration between these two different species. So when I talk about mycorrhizal fungi, I'm talking about a small portion of the soil food web. Now we're introducing trillions and trillions and trillions of organisms. And here we have the acidomycetes and the different bacteria and the different sapotrophic fungi breaking down organic matter. Below there, the next trophic layer, the predators and the nematodes feed off of the other microbes. That in turn releases nutrients and that's where some of the nutrition for plants come from. Um, I've always thought of the, the soil food web as my team. And, and my job as captain, as the farmer on my land, um, and that's a little bit arrogant to say I get to be captain, but I'm assuming that. My job as captain is not to screw up my team. Um, and it's a pretty, it releases a lot of the pressure on you. It's, it, your job is really to steward this, to let the magic happen, because you understand what's going on with the microbes. So this is a picture of what is known as an arbuscule, which is the nutrient transfer mechanism that's inside the cell of roots. And if, if you look at that arbuscule, you know, some of us probably see a tree. Others look at it, flip the other way, and you see the feeder root system of a plant. Others look at it, if you've been trained medically, you might be thinking about the bronchial system in our lungs where oxygen gets exchanged. I, uh, do a lot with healing plants because my wife Nancy is an herbalist and one of the traditions that has been passed down in herbal medicine is that of the doctrine of signatures and in the doctrine of signatures it's long been thought that when you look at a plant the way it grows maybe the way the leaf is shaped there's something in that that suggests that might be useful for this condition so it's kind of an intuitive approach to this when I look at those arbuscules and think about trees and feeder root systems, the exchange of oxygen in our blood. You know, there's a definite connection, a really core connection here to life itself on this planet. 95% of the plants on Earth have an affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. Initially, every plant began with this affiliation. Go back 400, 450 million years ago when ours was a water planet. And as the ocean started to recede, left behind in the tidal pool were two organisms. One were the uh, ancestors of what would become vascular plants, kind of algae-like. And those algae in the ocean water could absorb nutrients. But now as the ocean receded and they're on dried land, they lacked roots. There was no idea of soil yet. All of that was to come. But in that same tidal pool were oceanic fungi fungi that through their hyphae, through their mycelial mass, absorbed nutrients. And a surrogate root deal was struck. And those ancestors or va vascular plants teamed up with the fungi, and that was the initial root system. And it, it would take a long time for roots to develop and lignans to become part of the plant structure so it could be upright. And that very beginning point was a symbiotic union of fungus and plants. 
Since that time, there are groups of plants that have kind of declined the invitation to join with the fungi. Environmental conditions can also cause that if it's an overly lush, fertile NPK type soil, you usually will not get the fungal connection happening. Um, but plants like anything in the brassica family, broccolis, um, dock, buckwheat, anything in the amaranth family does not have this mycorrhizal affiliation. So that would include red beets, that would include Swiss chard. And, and you learn that part because it'll become relevant when we start talking about do I need to do anything to carry this fungal connection forward? What was my past cropping history? What's been done on this land? Um, but to understand that this is the normal way for plants to get nutrients and get it in a balanced form is where we begin to become really savvy as growers. So mycorrhizal advantage includes all sorts of things. When you have good beneficial organisms occupying a niche, then pathogenic disease-causing organisms don't have room at the end. So when we have a, a robust rhizosphere with lots of mycorrhizal and bacterial activity of the good nature, of the good sort, we're not gonna have an opportunity for soil-borne pathogens to take root. I'm gonna to explain to you how a root system is fairly limited in terms of the amount of soil volume it can access. And through the fungal mycelium, it multiplies again and again. And that's also important in terms of how plants get around nutrient depletion zones and find what they need. Um, all of that ties into healthy plant metabolism. So we're, we're gonna briefly explore what makes for a healthy plant. You know, my thing's apple trees and medicinal herbs. Your thing may be corn and soybeans or, or market vegetables or cut flowers. 95% of the plants on this planet have this affiliation. We all are tied to the fungi in one way or another. We're gonna learn how plants are gonna send messing, messaging through the plant community to give warnings, to tell other plants to prepare that something is on the way. All of this ties into how plants have a phytochemical response to resist disease. You know, often when we talk about, I want to plant the right cultivar of what I'm growing, one that has some resistance to certain diseases, and, and we're thinking that that's all about genetics. Um, in truth, where it really happens best of all is when we start tying into that soil biology. All those things together are really the basis of what make ecosystems resilient. And then there's one more little thing. Mycorrhizal fungi are the prime driver of storing, sequestering carbon in the soil. It's the action of plants in union with fungi that gets carbon down in the soil. So we have to know a few things just to launch where we're going with this. Um, there's different types of mycorrhizae. The one type that most plants affiliate with, about 85% of the plants, are the endomycorrhizae. E-N-D-O, they're the ones that form the arbu arbuscules in the cell. So they would also be known as arbuscular mycorrhizae. And if, if this was a feeder root, and I had the fungal presence in the root, I would have a mycelium that extends three to six inches out further. So that just allows me as a root to access a whole lot more soil volume. Now we're gonna compound that. The other major type, are the ectomycorrhizae, ECTO, and these are the ones that are affiliated with the roots of trees in the forest. And the ectomycorrhizae kind of fit like a glove, fingers into a glove. It's a real tight fit, but they have these long explorer hyphae, which can reach as much as 12 feet away. So th there's different attributes that come with the reach, soil volume, or distance in terms of these different fungi. And I'm, I'm gonna tie that together. We humans first started to recognize this relationship between fungi and roots as a positive thing in 1881. There was a Polish botanist named Franciscus Kamimitsk who said, this is good. However, 1881, think about it. We didn't really know what bacteria were. We, we didn't know anything about viruses. You know, we, we had this consciousness of germs and germs come from somewhere and we all get sick and and somehow we can't see it but 
something's happening, there's some little critters are, are not so good for us. And to start thinking about fungi penetrating into cells was hard to grasp. By the turn of the previous century, we had microscopes and people could actually see those arbuscules in the cell. But again, it's really hard to grasp that, can this be positive? Is, is this a good thing? Uh, World War I comes, um, the Spanish flu, 1917, 1918. 50 to 100 million human beings die in that influenza event. And again, it's where did it come from? The word influenza in Italian means from the stars. We, we didn't know about microbes. 1924, in Austria, Rudolf Steiner gives a series of lectures on agriculture. And it's a very esoteric thing, and, and it becomes the basis of what is known as biodynamic agriculture today. And in those talks, Steiner keeps alluding to the idea that it's not just the ground your crops are on, it's the trees and the meadows and, and the bushes and the hedgerows, and all together roots are merging, and they're, they're merging and nutrients are being shared, and what he referred to, he called this the common root being. Today, scientists call it the common mycorrhizal network. And this network, maybe we'll do it right here now. We're going to become a plant community. So wiggle your toes, because the hyphae are going to come up through your toes, and they're going to start to connect us. Some of us are of the same plant species, so we're going to affiliate definitely with the same fungi. Some of us are going to have multiple affiliations with different fungi, which are going to tie to other plant species entirely different than that first group. And within this, this complex of the plant community, we're going to have some trees on the edge with the long runner explorer hyphae. And what's happening is certain plants become passage plants. Fungi bring nutrients to that plant which aren't necessarily needed by that plant. They're in the protoplasm of the fungal mycelium. They're now in the plant sap. And now they're directed out through another fungal pipeline. So now nutrients, water, can start to be connected, uh, directed where it's needed within the plant community. Um, this whole notion of the common mycorrhizal network, you know, just 100 years, Steiner's calling it a, 100 years ago, Steiner is calling it the common root being. And how much more do we know since that time? Probably about 5% more of what's to be known. We're, we're still in kindergarten, you know, it's, there's so much more to be discovered about what's going on here. Now, within our plant community, besides the herbs and the vegetables and the apple trees and the berry bushes and the grasses and the clovers, all of which have an affiliation with endomycorrhizae, and besides the trees of the forest, the deciduous trees, the hardwood trees, the coniferous trees, the spruce, the pine, the fir, there's also what are known as soft hardwoods. And soft hardwoods are species like alder and willow and popple, soft maple, possibly pawpaw. Again, we don't know all who does what, but these are plants that affiliate with both ectotypes and endotypes. They become what I call bridge trees. And now they're joining even more nutritional suppliers and bringing it all together to spread throughout the plant community. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that idea of bridge trees in a few pictures. This is a picture of my orchard. Um, this is not straight rows. I'm capable of laying out a straight row. Um, <laughs> but it fits the contour, the terrain of the land. And there's all kinds of plants out there. And, and it's not just apple trees in an herbicide strip with a narrow lane of grass where I drive the tractor. There's many, many different plants. That diversity above means greater diversity below. Now, let's just get a, a sense of the numbers here because when we talk about microbiology, it, it's, it's hard to comprehend. You've wriggled your toes. You've got your, your roots in the ground. Now think about the volume of soil under just one of your feet. If we were outside in a diverse ecosystem, beneath your foot, were we to stretch it out from end to end, there's approximately 300 miles of fungal hyphae. Most of this is mycorrhizae. Some of it is sapotrophic decomposition fungi hyphae. You know, I live in northern New Hampshire, 
and 300 miles, that's enough filaments that I could stretch out to reach Daniel's farm. I don't know if Daniel is here from the west side of Montreal. I could get to his farm and walk back on that amount of hyphae. And, and that that's, gives you a sense of, of what is out there. Now, for us today, in learning more about things, we're starting to look at how nutrients move in an ecosystem, how a mycorrhizal network connects things. Unfortunately, to really get a, some numbers to this and, and to think about it, we have to set up more reductionist trials. So this trial I have here on the screen was a clover plant with three affiliations to different fungi. And by using root chambers, they were able to isolate the three types of fungi and, and see when the fungi brought phosphorus, which did the plant choose to work with, and, and kind of postulated that the better deal, more carbon sugars were offered to the fungi who had more phosphorus. This is not really what's going on. There's another dynamic taking place. When plants are interacting with the biology in the soil, as much as two-thirds of the photosynthates that they produce through photosynthesis I'm talking now about the simple sugars, the energy of the sun, now into a, a carbon sugar, is directed down into the root zone to be traded with the biology. There's a reason plants invest their carbon currency to that extent, because they get so much ba more back in exchange. So here in our plant community, let's say right th out there in the middle, there's a number of you that really have great access, you're taller, you're, you're up there, the higher plants in the canopy, you're getting the most sunshine because your surface volume, your surface area that's exposed to that sunshine allows you to photosynthesis, synthesize all the more. And so you're relatively rich, you're relatively well off, you have a lot of carbon currency to trade. The fungal network, however, says, that's nice, but you're going to need to pay a little bit more for the same thing we're going to distribute to other plants in the community who aren't as well off. And because you pay a little bit more, the fungal network, in turn, is going to be able to collaborate further and get all the more nutri nutri nutrition into the plant community. And it may be that over there, there's a really strong need for zinc. And over here, you need water. This is a little bit higher ground. And, and too well drained and, and it dries out too quickly. The fungal network can start distributing moisture, trace minerals, calcium complexes, phosphorus, and all of it is driven by that trade, that underground economy, driven by carbon sugars. When you start to think this way, it's not about the well-off plants getting the most, it works more like a social democracy, and it, it, it just truly does. So when I talk about the plants and the fungi have teachings for us, it's something to start thinking about, you know, this collaboration that's benefiting more than just a few. The endomycorrhizal realm is something we cannot see. We don't see the, the hyphae, unless we have a microscope, we don't see those arbuscules in the cell. And yet it's something we really should see. And we should see it through our intuition, through our imagination. We should be really aware of it because this is where plant health comes from. This is our job, whether we, we get into that stewardship role, at the very least, to not screw up, to be giving thoughts to. When mycorrhizal fungi extend those hyphae out into the soil, there's points in the season where roots are reaching out for nutrients, there's points where plants retract and the mycorrhizal fungi follow that. There's an ebb and a flow to it. And when they retract, they, believe, they leave behind a protein substance called lamellin. That lamellin consists of 40% carbon. That's one of the ways that carbon is being put down in the soil. Mycorrhizal fungi are also the creators of these little gated communities where a particle of clay and a particle of sand and a particle of silt are combined together to form a soil aggregate. The glue, again, is this lamellin. We know soil aggregates as the basis of, of good farming, of, of good tilth. And as microaggregates become macroaggregates, 
um, we're creating that crumbly soil structure that is just ideal for growing in. That, that's our goal. We can visually see that aspect. This is an example of what's happening in, in the networking realm. Here in our community, over on that edge, aphids have moved in, or maybe it's grasshoppers, some pest that's feeding on the plant. The plants are a little bit stressed. They respond phytochemically to try to make themselves a little less desirable. That response in turn is out through the roots. It's picked up by the fungal network. And over here, we're receiving this signal that this is going on. What we do on this side of the plant community is we start emitting certain volatile odors that are meant to draw beneficial insects that are going to eat those aphids. And we're drawing them to ourselves before the aphids have even got here. So th this is the plant community communicating. So there's a sense of what do we need to prepare for? You know, this is the original internet. It's actually a much more intelligent internet. Um, <clears throat> as farmers and growers, we also need to have some understanding of how fungi carry forward from one growing season to the next. So <clears throat> one of the ways is just by the fact that the mycelium continues to reach and more plants are brought into the fold. That's happening in the growing season. Another way, and particularly with annual crops, but perennial crops, it's the same thing is true, is the hyphae continue through the winter in the root tissues. So in annual crops, as, as those roots, the organic matter that made up those roots breaks down, that keeps the hyphae alive for on the order of six months. So that next spring, when another crop comes in, those root fragments can be a source of mycorrhizal inoculation to carry things forward. Now, understanding that should be telling you something. If, if you're a gardener and you've picked your peas and you picked your beans and you picked your tomatoes, but then you go and you rip everything out by the roots and you throw it in the compost pile, you pulled out the mycorrhizal fungi hyphae aspect and it's not there anymore. So the whole idea behind <clears throat> flail mowing, flail chopping, or, or some kind of leaving the residues on the surface but not tearing up the roots, now you're starting to think fungally. You're, you're, you're doing something that's going to help the mycorrhizal connection carry forward to the next crop. Um, and then, of course, because these are fungi, they sporulate. And it's through the spores, basically a fungal seed, that another connection to another plant in another place is going to take place. Now, let's go a little deeper with what's happening with spores. Ectomycorrhizal fungi reproduce sexually. And so they have a fruiting body, which we know as puff balls and certain types of mushrooms. And a mushroom might um, cast as many as 30 billion spores. It's up in the air. So ectotype mycorrhizae have spores that can be carried by the wind and also can deal with the fact that they're out there in the sunshine. So after a forest fire, fungal, the fungal network is destroyed as well as the plant cover. It's not that hard for nature to repopulate that ground. On the other hand, with endotypes, which most plants that we're working with have, these are an underground species. These are the ones that are invisible. Their spores are not made to be up in the sunshine. They're smooth. They're not carried by the wind. They get around in the guts of earthworms, maybe on the back of a burrowing mammal. Um, it, it's not a fast process. It's not assured if some kind of soil disturbance or degradation took place and the fungal aspect was lost, it isn't restored fast. And, and a really good example of this, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupts and some 230 square miles are subject to temperatures on the order of like 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The plant communities are destroyed, so is the biology in the soil going down several inches. And it isn't until 20 years later that plants and their fungal partners fully are restored back within the heart of that 230 square miles. Now, that, that's a dramatic example, but 
now start thinking about acreage in terms of your fields. Start thinking about a very disturbed soil situation. Um, you know, chemicals are harsh on biology. Herbicides are harsh on biology. Monocrop corn, without a fallow, without cover cropping, year after year after year, you're starting to get a very non-fungal place going there. And to convert it, whether it's you who's been doing the corn growing or a new owner on that land, a new steward, to convert it, it takes a while till it comes back. And so you can hasten that process. One of the things to know is, is that in any given healthy ecosystem, there's going to be as many as 50 different fungal species involved. So when I say diversity above is one important thing to think about, diversity below is also very important. And, and with fungal species, mycorrhizal species, different fungi have different gifts. So when I talked about zinc being moved over that way, there's a zinc specialist, there's a manganese specialist. And remember, we don't actually know who's who. We've identified them to a degree, but we don't know the whole range of skill sets. Um, some of these fungi are gonna be really good at helping get calcium into a plant. Most all of them have the skill set to move phosphorus. They work with solubilizing bacteria to get that unavailable phosphorus, which is in all soils, and make it available and deliver it. So the fact that we want diversity and we start to recognize that different fungi have different skill sets, and now we're aware of spores, and there are ways to culture spores so that commercial inoculum can be made available to restore some of this connection um, leads to this notion of commercial inoculum. And what I like to teach people here is there are products out there with just one species. There are products with four species. We're now starting to talk about getting some different skill sets involved here as we start to restore this connection in a degraded place. There are products with as many as nine endomycorrhizal species, which is what I really like to use. In these, what I call the core four, um, that second one, Glamis mossi, there's, there's different, three different species of fungi that are noted for moving water in the ecosystem. Glamis mossi is one of those. Glamis desicola and Glamis fasciculatum are the other two. A quality inoculum product is going to have one of these three in there because moving water is a really important skill set. When, when you start to think about desertification and plants no longer growing in a place, part of that story is the dryness and drought and plants die and then you come back and humans can try to put plants back and, and have a water source to water it, but you can't lose sight of the fact that the fungal connection is what's really going to carry that forward if it's going to become a renewed green place. And it, it's through the fungi. Another type are the Ericaceae fungi. So now I'm talking specifically about acid-loving plants like blueberries and heathers and mountain laurel, rhododendron. These fungi are really needed by those plants. If you're a blueberry grower of whatever scale, you know that blueberries have a very shallow root system. Blueberries need watering because they don't have that much of reach. Well, when they have the fungal connection, they start to have a whole lot more reach, but they need this very specific type of mycorrhizal fungi, which is not produced, <coughs> excuse me, commercially. One of the places that these fungi come from, spores can live for a long time. And when peat moss is made and brought onto the farm, used as a potting soil, nine out of 11 samples of peat moss usually have the Ericaceae mycorrhizal fungi, and it's gonna get those blueberries growing. I spent a, a minute on that just to tell you, like if you have blueberries and they've been struggling, you need to get this connection in place. And maybe that means going and putting some more peat moss down around those plants. Maybe it means going to a place in the wild where you know that low bush blueberries are growing and taking some of that soil and bringing it back to where your blueberries are because very likely in the wild, the Ericaceae mycorrhizae are there. So there's, there's a lot of practical things to be known, 
about the mycorrhizal types and about inoculum and when you might want to do it. Um, that's something we all want to invest some time in learning more. But when I start thinking about all the lessons that mycorrhizae offer, what's going on here, I, uh, I recognize that the biolog biological kingdom is it's relentlessly pointing to this idea of cooperation and support networks. And going deep with this aspect of plant science is only going to scratch the surface of, of what I refer to as plant wisdom. In Rachel Carson's day, who wrote Silent Spring, there was an ecologist friend of hers named Frank Egler. And he said exactly what I feel in contemplating all this. He said, nature is not more complicated than we think. Nature is more complicated than we can think. I'm fine with that. You know, again, I'm, I'm the captain of the team maybe. I'm a really humble captain and I just don't want to screw things up. And I don't have to know all the details, all the pieces. I'm curious enough, I want to know more and more and more. But to just recognize that biology, when it gets humming, make, does all kinds of incredible, intelligent things in terms of the plant community as a whole is really good enough. Let's look at the plant side of all this. When we talk about a healthy plant, we are referring to the whole metabolic pathway that takes place. And in, in one sense, this looks like something we don't have much to do with. The plants are out there in the sunshine. Photosynthesis happens. Plant sugars are created. Nitrogen is combined with the carbohydrate sugars to create proteins and fatty acids. Um, that in turn, if that process goes all the way, plants start producing secondary plant metabolites, which are the compounds which help it resist diseases and pests. So we want this process to go all the way, but it can be either sluggish or it can be robust. Now, those of you who've worked with cover crops and you're building that soil till, you often see those robust plants, but what, what's really going on there? We need to know a little bit more. Photosynthesis is efficient if a wide array of trace minerals are available to that plant. Efficient photosynthesis means you have a plant, not just high up in the canopy, but using that sunshine to produce more photosynthates than a sluggish plant would. And the trace minerals, things like manganese and boron, copper, iron, zinc, um, that's what I'm talking about here. Now, there are things that we can do. Um, I've talked about um, a layer of azomite clay on my compost piles as I build them because azomite is an ocean deposit that supposedly contains all the minerals from A to Z. I talked about different things in my foliar sprays at certain critical points in the growth cycle in my fruit orchard, but this is relevant to all plants where I add trace minerals just because I know that it's, it's part of what the plant needs to do the metabolic process efficiently. But the biology is playing a role here too. So go back to that idea of, of the trees in the forest with ectomycorrhizae that have these explorer hyphae that reach as much as 12 feet. Well, if you go down 12 feet, and often you don't have to go 12 feet, at least on my farm, to hit bedrock or ledge, that means that the fungal hyphae can penetrate down to the bedrock. And the hyphae themselves are getting plant sugars for energy from the plant, and they share some of that plant sugar with bacteria that travel along the length of the hyphae. Those bacteria create organic acids, and what you have is the ability of the bacteria, the acids, to dissolve bedrock, which the fungi in turn picks up to bring back to the plant. And it, it's really like a rotary hammer being operated by a microbial battery cell that's bringing mineralization back to the surface of the, the soil where a lot of plants are picking up their majority of their nutrients. So when I talked about bridge trees having the ecto affiliation and the endo affiliation, if you're working with a polyculture or you're leaving hedgerows of things like willow and alder popple, then this is part of your 
plant community and part of the remineralization process. Now, I, I had a very simple drawing made of this notion of the bacterial bore for my book because I, I wanted to reflect the energetics of, of what was going on. But another reason for it was that sometimes the fungi can be really naughty. And, and this is a joke. Come on, you're Indiana, it's a joke. <laughs> um, and this was not, I didn't want to have an X-rated book, so I, I couldn't really show this photo without getting into trouble. Plants go on from there to do protein synthesis. Again, so now we're talking about nitrogen combined with carbohydrate sugars, and that creates amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And if protein synthesis is complete, something happens that's going to help a lot on the pest and disease front. This metabolic process is also very dependent on a wide availability of trace minerals. And, and what happens is that foliar feeding insects with simple digestive systems basically tap into the plant sap to feed off of simple sugars and amino acids. Fungal diseases in the spotting and mildew category tap into plant sap to feed off of amino acids. So if protein synthesis is more complete, there's a lot less amino acids in the plant sap for the insects to get feed off of, for the disease to lodge and cause an infection. And this isn't about that you medicated the plant. This is just simple plant physiology and what's going on if metabolic processes are complete. Now, inside of, of every cell is a cell membrane. <clears throat> and leaf cell, stem cell, root cell, there's a cell membrane. And that cell membrane consists of a phosphobilipid bilayer. And proteins can lodge in that bilayer. Simple sugars can pass through into the cytoplasm within the cell. And that's where they go when they're not available to the pests. And it's, it's a really brilliant scheme of how nature takes those nutrients and uses them, saves them for a rainy day, and makes it unavailable for disease and pests. So that, that's what's happening in a robust plant. One of the things I've observed is that beneficial patterns show up constantly in creation. And if you start thinking about our planet now as a cell membrane, the fungal mycelium where soils have not been disturbed, the fungal mycelium has not been broken, that's a lot like that phospholipid bilayer. And it's the mycelium putting carbon in the soil, working the carbon cycle on the planet. Um, that is, is, is one of the, the key factors that life on Earth works. It's really important that we understand it. This is, is a way of, I think of it as the mycelium holding life's sacred trust. Um, just as photosynthesis is a miracle. This is a miracle. Back to the plants. Plants go on from there to produce fatty acids, which become lipid compounds. Um, these are stored in seeds. They're stored in, in most plant cells. And it, it's essentially reserve energy for a rainy day. When photosynthesis is limited and diseases come on the scene, plants with more fats are going to be able to get through that more higher disease pressure time. So we want fat synthesis to take place. If it's robust, there'll be three to four times as much production of these fatty acids. Some of them go into the cuticle, which is the waxy covering on the leaf or the fruits of the plant, and that's how plants resist rots. It's, it's really important stuff. This is why if one plant appears healthy, a sluggish plant is having issues. Plants go on from there to produce these resistance metabolites. This is what herbalists love, because this is the medicine we use as people. But plants are producing it for themselves in response to their environmental reality. So those terpenoids, those flavonoids, those polyphenols are really key when a fungal disease hyphae pushes in there into that plant sap to find those amino acids. It's also encountering a phytochemical response to rebuff it, to push it out. So plants that go all the way with healthy plant metabolism have more of this. That's a good thing. This whole one way to look at the, the biology around the rhizosphere, it's much like the rumen of a cow. 
uh, the cow's chewing her cud. The nutrients are being prepared to be taken in. They're going through this process. The microbes, when they dissolve soil nutrients, which are brought to the root zone through the fungi, when the bacteria, the rhizobacteria and the bacillus subtilis and all the other different species directly there in the root zone, microbe is eating microbe, plants are able to absorb some of their nutrition in a partially built form. That may not seem important, but it's a lot like eat the difference between eating junk food and eating nutrient dense food and more rich, think pasture, raised chickens and eggs that have a much deeper yellow yolk. We know that's good for us. Bacterial and fungal metabolites are good for plants because it gives them more re reserve energy to go further on that metabolic highway. And the biggest honcho of all in this scheme are mycorrhizal fungi. And those arbuscules that I showed in that earlier picture in the root cell, they last on the order of three to seven days. They're growing, they're trading nutrients, the pressure is getting greater and greater, and eventually the internal part of the mycelium shuts off that arbuscule. That arbuscule now dissolves into the plant protoplasm, and it dissolves in such a way that we're talking about structural wall proteins, we're talking about lipids, we're talking about polyphosphates, polysaccharides. This is deep nutrition, this is partially built nutrition. And, and this sacrifice, so to speak, of the mycorrhizal fungi, they're moving on to other cells. The mycelium keeps growing, expanding, ebb and flowing. This sacrifice of that arbuscule is, is really like phantasmagoria. It's, it's as good as it gets for plants in terms of having really good nutrients to do their thing. Now, the fungal kingdom can be broken into di different sections. We're talking about mycorrhizal fungi. The sapotrophic fungi are the ones that break down organic matter, de decomposers, and it's really important. Organic matter is that carbon cycle in action. That's where nutrients are gonna come from. On the surface of the plant, I did a workshop on this this morning, are epiphytic fungi within the cells of leaves and stems and the cambium of trees are endophytic fungi. And finally, the last group, the parasitic and pathogenic fungi, the ones that cause disease. A hundred years ago when we started to find ways to toxify the environment to kill the pathogen, we didn't really give thought to the fact that what we were doing, first with copper, then with sulfur, then with chemistry, EBDC fungicides, and on and on, we weren't giving thought to the fact that in spraying the surface of the plant, we were taking out fungal partners above. Fungicides drip to the soil. They kill sapotrophic fungi, they kill mycorrhizal fungi. We created this paradigm where plants were more and more bereft of the normal way they take up nutrients, the normal way they build up resistance to disease, and the result is crops that need more and more fungicides. You, you can see how it's all kind of coming back around at us. This, this is the picture of the stomate on the bottom side of the leaf. That stomate, when it has lots of microbial guardians, both bacterial and fungal, um, is able through those guards to rebuff disease organisms that try to get in through that stomate. It, it's a really complex, beautiful world. It's, it's amazing to live in this time that we have these electron scanned microscopic pictures and we, we can see these sort of things and think about them. Um, Fukuoka spoke how the healing of the land and the purification of the human spirit is the same process. And you know, when I'm out with my apple trees or my hands are in the soil, it, it to me is a, it's a blessing time, you know, that I get to share in what's going on there. And I think, you know, all of us, as we start to talk about more the spiritual nature of the work that we do with plants and with soil, really recognize what I'm saying here. Um, but for most human beings, they don't have that connection. And things are admittedly not looking up. More and more people just don't understand what nature is, is calling us, demanding us to do, to keep that sacred trust of the planet alive and thriving. 
Mark Twain, I love Mark Twain, um, said something about if voting made any difference, they wouldn't let us do it. And, and I'm not about to get political on you. Um, but the point here is, this is not about looking to the government or corporations to fix things. It's, it's really up to us. Um, people who have an understanding of the soil, of plants. And, and this is really a big part of the picture. You hear a lot about we need to uh, burn less fossil fuels. That's valid. But we really need to restore mycorrhizal connection and plant health on millions of acres of land, hundreds of acres, thousands of acres of land, because that's the real engine, the photosynthesis engine, where carbon gets put back in the soil. Um, so in being up to us, um, to farmers and to gardeners, catching this fungal tide and leading the way, you know, the most motivating emotions that we have are concern, interest, and hope. And by working daily with the soil, with the animals, understanding plant health, um, I feel that. I, I can, you know, when I travel, I live in northern New Hampshire. I come down through the mountain pass called Franconia Notch, and I start to see more cars, and, and then there's bigger towns and cities, and there's more people. And then the plain lands in Indianapolis, and it's just more and more people. I'm not always as hopeful, but then I get back to my trees and the soil, and, and I know that there's something good here, and, and I just need to spread this message, just like all of you need to get more people to be conscious of these connections that make life possible. Um, you can see what good notes are. It's like, I hardly look at this stuff, and it's like, <laughs> I forget all about it. Farming with the consciousness of the mycorrhizae leads to what I've called the non-disturbance principle. And we begin with gratitude, always with gratitude. I have a lot of gratitude for the woman in this picture. This is my wife, Nancy. We grasp that as humans, there are numerous ways to harm the life forces in the soil, from excessive tillage to over-reliance on chemicals. We move on to see ways to accomplish our agricultural goals with respect for the fungal realm. And by doing so, we honor this living planet and the integrity of all species. Otto Leopold put it another way. He talked about a land ethic a land ethic that changes our role, the Homo sapiens species, to recognize we are not above all the other species. We're just a mere member of the community. And we need to, we need to gain some humility and start to recognize that it's all species together, working in collaboration is how we're gonna continue on this planet. You know, we can talk about regenerative agriculture. It's exciting stuff. There are many ways we can collaborate. We are just one species among many on this beautiful earth. Now, when we get into talking about biological transition, um, this is a schematic showing a grazing land over the course of three growing season. And, and you can see without disturbance, different connections are being made between different plants and, and, and different organisms in the soil. It's getting more complex. It takes some time, you know, our work with perennial systems, with no-till farming, with low-impact forestry, that's all restoring some of these biological connections. As we start to understand this, we get better at doing it. Nevertheless, it's still gonna take some time. Bill Mollison, whose teachings inspired the permaculture movement, and he said this about probably 20 to 30 years ago, is that we really need to train our young people to help to bring these degraded lands back. He said this when many of us were probably young people, um, and that it's really a last chance to restore these kind of connections I'm talking about, because this is how the earth works. Um, I find I don't have all the answers to the society's problems today, to the cultural madness that makes up these times, but I do know how to put my hands in this earth, to love this planet with the tenacity that the fungi and the plants need from us right now. You know, I, as much as I can sometimes get into a funk, I'm just so excited about what's happening in regenerative agriculture, uh, with people learning how to carry forward the fungal connection. Um, we'll talk just a, briefly about some 
cover crop superstars. Um, something like sedan grass has an affiliation with 50 different species of mycorrhizal fungi. You inoculate sedan grass with those nine species products I was talking about, they're probably all going to take. The sedan grass is also going to take in some more fungal partners. It's, it's a primary crop to start restoring connection in a field that's been abused. Um, and to take that year with the sedan grass cover and work it with the fungi sets up the next cropping cycle to find that connection in place in a very diverse fashion. Um, understanding about those root fragments, using surface decomposition properly, using the biology to enhance it. In the garden, inoculating your bean seed, inoculating your, your garlic cloves when you're planting garlic in the fall if you grow hard neck varieties. I inoculate our potatoes. Um, potatoes are subject to late blight and other fungal diseases. I want the mycorrhizal connection. I want potatoes to get partially built nutrition. It's how they're going to withstand the disease pressures that come. Back to the roots of this word, mycorrhiza. Fungi and plant together. It takes two to tango. Um, one of the biggest, uh, really, crimes that we commit in agriculture is something you can see when you fly over the, the country in early winter or the beginning of spring and you see ground that was cropped and then left fallow, left bare through the growing season, uh, through going into the winter snow cover or not snow cover, coming out into spring, bare ground, no plants there, no photosynthesis, no active fungal connection, no formation of soil aggregates. We give up half the year often when we could be allowing the fungi to continue to build soil aggregates, to continue to put carbon in the soil. This is a picture of one of my favorite fall combinations. Um, I plant oats with tillage radish and with field peas in August. And field peas are fixing nitrogen. Oats have a lot of organic mass. They're working with the fungi. Tillage radish is in the brassica family, so it doesn't join in with the mycorrhizal fun, but on the other hand, it has this deep root that breaks up soil compaction. And all three of these plants winter kill. I come into spring with this very friable soil, lots of root fragments carrying forward fungal connection, but the mulch itself, there's nothing growing in that. It's perfect for planting the next round of plants that I'm going to do. And, and you start to learn these combinations, what works in your place. But you want to have plants growing throughout the year to the extent that you can. Let, let's go fungal on a farm scale. So this is a, a picture of an Indiana farmer wa walking in his soybean field. Um, <laughs> no, actually, this is Hawaii. And, and this is the taro plant from which, no, the caro plant from which they get the taro root. And, that would be pretty cool to walk under a plant with leaves of, of that size, that extent. Um, but what we're looking at here is how can we grow healthy plants and really promote what I've been talking about in terms of the fungal connection between plants and mycorrhizal fungi. So th this notion of cover crop cocktails has been building. More and more people are starting to understand that a mix of plant species can be a lot more effective than a single species cover crop planting. And, and in this case, we're looking at a cornfield. And when the corn was about a foot high, it was interseeded with a mix of different cover crop species. That suppresses weeds, but more so, it's building a diverser plant community that's going to assist the corn in the ways that I've been talking about. This is a uh, Christine Jones, who's a soil ecologist from Australia. And I heard her at Acres a couple years ago. And she brought up this idea of plant quorum sensing. And what she was talking about was that when you get a diverse mix of plants, you achieve a certain amount of diversity, different skill sets are now involved, you're going to get a much more resilient result. And, but if you come short of that, you're not going to see that result. And, and she told us about these trials that were done. It was either in North 
Dakota extension or it was up in the Great Plains of Canada. But the research involved growing triticale, which is a hybrid cross between wheat and rye. And triticale planted by itself, this was a very, very dry summer. Um, was showing all the stress signs of, of that summer being that dry. Triticale grown with one, two, or three other cover crop species interplanted was showing all the stress signs of drought. The triticale planted with four, five, six, seven different species of cover crops, some legumes, some flowering plants, was showing all the signs of drought stress. The triticale planted with eight different companions looked like somebody was regularly irrigating it, and they weren't. What was happening was there was now enough different plant partners who had different affiliations with different fungi and different bacteria, and when the whole team was assembled, there were enough skill sets that water was being moved throughout that plant community. Roots were going deeper, and that's what was meant by plant quorum sensing. Now, I went from that talk where was this? This was, I think this one was in Cincinnati. And right after talk, everyone gets in the elevator to go back to their rooms before the reception, that kind of thing. And the elevator held about 20 people. And I, I think my room was like on the eighth floor. And a couple people got off, another floor, another couple people got off. And then it was my turn to get off. And I, I turned to the other remaining 16 or so people in the elevator and said, I don't know if you know about elevator quorum sensing, but there's a certain point where there may not be enough of you for that thing to go up anymore. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thich Nhat Hanh talks about the next Buddha may be human communities working together, cooperating, supporting, finding networks, just like you're finding with whether it's raising free-range beef and arranging to be able to slaughter it and be able to sell it, or food co-ops, um, the urban farming movement, you know, much of this is happening. Um, and what we're doing, if you think about it, is we're taking the teachings of the fungi, learning a little bit more about how we might do things a little bit better. I'm gonna just give a few more slides related to the trees of the forest. Mycorrhizal applications is the source of, of much of the inoculum that's sold today, and it's, it's often sold under different brand names as well. Uh, but Mike Amaranth Amaranthus um, really started, he was a forester in Oregon, and he started to inoculate seedlings because they, they replant after they cut the forest out there. And those seedlings had much greater rates of survival, and, and they grew much quicker than a non-inoculated seedling. So we actually owe quite a lot to him in this time because 30 years ago he was ahead of the curve and, and got things going in this respect. So when we go into the forest, we're talking about ectomycorrhizal species. We're talking about fungi that reap, have fruiting bodies, the mushrooms. And when you look at this list, if, if you're people who gathered edible mushrooms, you go out and you look for chanterelles, or you look for black trumpets, or matsusaki, or morals, um, black trumpets. All of those are mycorrhizal species. I'm, I'm going to give you a clue. If you want to become a better mushroom hunter, you start off by not looking down where the mushrooms are. You start off by looking up to see what trees are growing, because these different mushrooms are affiliated with different tree species. Then you start to recognize what are the habitats. Um, there's a ecologist in British Columbia named Susan Simard. And you might have heard of her work, but what she did was looked at what was going on with the mycorrhizal connections in the forest, and she discovered that a mother tree, the tree that produced the seeds, um, her seedlings would grow in the vicinity of where she was, and that her babies we're not out there in the direct sunshine, and the mother tree would direct carbon photosynthates to the babies so that they could grow until their turn in the sun came. She also discovered that the mother tree would redirect its own roots to carve out a niche where the baby could have root room. Um, 
And, and that all sounds really fantastical, and it's like, how do we know that that, that tree, um, which is very much a sentient, sentient being, knows about its own seedlings, and the fungi are doing that. Another lesson. In my part of the world, um, there's a lot of white birch, and there's also balsam fir, spruce trees. There's a mycorrhizal symbiosis that goes on with these trees. And that is that in the summer, when the birches have their leaves and they're photosynthesizing to beat the band, they share some of those photosynthates with the fir trees and the spruce trees that are down in the shade. The leaves fall, and now the birch trees and the fir trees are the ones that are getting the sunshine. They're photosynthesizing, and they share some of their photosynthates back with the white birches. You're getting this idea of collaboration on a large, large scale. A big topic today is, is things like agroforestry, planting trees in an annual cropping system, whether it's annual crops grown between these wide swaths of ground between the tree rows, or it's grazed ground. Um, what's happening in agroforestry is bringing more fungal diversity to the fore, which makes these different parts of the plant community thrive. You know, grazing has a big piece of what's going on here. You graze correctly, holistic um, grazing management, what Al Alan Savory talks about. You encourage plants to send their roots deeper. When roots go deeper, mycorrhizal fungi go deeper. That means carbon is stored to even deeper depths in the soil. All of it is a piece of what we need to do. And um, Rachel Carson talked about how contemplating the beauty of the earth is how we find reserves of strength to endure. You know, I'm trying to incite a fungal revolution. I'm trying to get you excited about this connection to understand how it comes together. Um, the point of sharing all these ways, we may not be able to change the world individually, but we can each change our world and the place that we live on the land that we love and steward. Perhaps one of the real gifts of the fungi uh, isn't so much the carbon solution as much as it is showing us a way forward. That to cooperate is to find bounty for all involved. Fungal networking doesn't overlook the youngest or the least in the crowd. Most telling is that of one life giving to the next, that hyphalysis that I was telling you about. It's written in the book of Matthew, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. That's a teaching that does not apply to our species alone. It's to all the species on Earth. Think about Aldo Leopold. And this testament, which speaks so passionately to our human hearts, goes further than our species. You know? And if we have ears to hear what the mycorrhizae are telling us, if we have eyes to see what tiny critters do on behalf of the whole, it's, it's a lesson. It's, it's a prompt. This is what we need to do in our farming. We need to take that non-disturbance principle to heart. You know, I call this talk a soil redemption song for a reason. And, and, and it has to do with my having been an, a picker on a migrant hippie picking crew picking apples in Vermont. And part of that crew was made up of people from St. Vincent, Jamaica. And so I, in my 20s, was introduced to reggae music. And so now we're talking Bob Marley. Some of you know this music. And Bob Marley has a song about redemption song. He, he, he speaks how there are many redemption songs. And I think of the plants and the fungi as singing the soil redemption song. And, and we can count on them to continue to do it as they always have. We just need to stop messing it up to the extent that we have. And we can turn things around because we have the plants and the fungi to sing that redemption song for us. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer some questions. But they all want beer or cider or wine. That's good.
Go do your fungal things. That's your job now. Thank you. <laughs>